thank you very much. Uh, so I was, I was given a task to uh, lecture on, on introduction to instantons. So I'll try to start with uh, something pretty elementary. So we will be looking at path integrals in Euclidean quantum field theory, which means that uh, the space-time will be a Riemannian manifold. Um, but the space of fields may be uh, complexified. So the, the, uh, the reasoning for, for this uh, step is the finite dimensional analogy. So in finite dimensional integrals, it is convenient sometimes to deform the contour of integration. And so even if your original integral was, let's say, of something real over, the, over a real manifold, you may end up uh, calculating it by something like residues. And that's that you do by uh, deforming the contour away into the complex, uh, complex domain. So a typical example. So we'll be interested in, in integrals of this form. Uh, so you start with, so this is a finite, finite dimensional <coughs> analogy. So you start with some, let's say, manifold x with the volume form omega. And s is a real function. And uh, so that's the, the original integral. But then, uh, and so you want to study this, this uh, exponential integral as a function, let's say, of h bar, of the small parameter. But then you, you view this original manifold x as sitting inside its complexification, whatever it means. And so this becomes, uh, So we we'll, would like to, this volume form to extend to a holomorphic volume form. On the complexification, so this complexification contains the original space x. Uh, this function extends to a holomorphic function. And then you uh, realize that, well, this original quantity uh, is a particular case of, of a family of actually of a, uh, of a variety of possible uh, integrals where you choose, so gamma, you choose a middle dimensional Contour in this uh, complexified space, uh, with the only restriction that this integral should converge. So uh, typically, what you do, you look. So you define, let's say, a kind of <coughs> subspace where. Uh, so it's the so you take the real part of uh, s divided by h bar. And so you, you expect this integral to converge when this real part is, is very large. So you take the pre-image of uh, of the set of very large values of the real part. So this is sitting inside 
this xc. So typically, it's some kind of of some sectors. We don't we don't really care about what happens in the interior, but far away at the, at, uh, towards towards infinities in the space xc, we want the real part of s over h bar to be very large, and so your contours are anything which which uh, goes to infinity along along these directions. And so gamma has a homology class, which is in the uh, middle dimensional relative homology group. Um, so it means that what it means that the gamma is a chain whose boundary should be somewhere in, the, in this region. Um, and so, uh, so you, have a set, you have a choice of, of this contrast gamma. And in, in, in this way, you get a vector valued function of h bar. So the original integral is just one component of this function. Uh, but, but the reason we want to study all of these functions is that uh, this function s may have some parameters, and as we vary these parameters uh, holomorphically, uh, the components of this vector will get permuted eventually. So this is some kind of uh, fundamental object, and it's typically a fundamental solution to a system of linear equations called Picard-Fuchs equations. These are equations on the space of parameters of the function s. Uh, is it, it is independent of gamma, or your it's a vector? So it's a, so it's a vector. Gamma. Is, so it's a uh, gamma lab labels the components of the vector. What do you mean? It's independent of gamma. It depends on gamma. Yeah. So, that's yeah. Okay. so gamma is a discrete. It's a discrete label. So this is. Uh, I mean, it's a, this is a. It's a. It's a group. Okay. Um, and so, so you can view z of h bar as va valued in the vector space, which is a complexification of that space. So in y action is a homomorphic function. Well, you, you well, that's 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 my that's your assumption that you extend the real function <laughs> on the real manifold to a homomorphic function on its complexification. It's not always possible, but uh, we'll we'll assume it's uh, it is possible, and in it it is always possible in in, in cases uh, of interest where. Functions are typically polynomials, so you, polynomials are homomorphic functions. All right. Uh, so uh, the next step in this analysis is to find different bases in the same vector space. So here, I, the, the, to define the integrals, you you are concerned basically with infinities in in this in this space X C. So you you want the integrals uh, integral to converge. But uh, there is another viewpoint, which is, uh, which is actually dictated by the quasi-classical limit. So if you take the limit h bar going to 0, <coughs> then the integrals are dominated by the critical, by the saddle points, by the critical points. of s. And uh, so there is a different basis. Well, it's different. Uh, maybe I didn't tell you how it, I, uh, we didn't discuss any specific choice of the basis in, in the space. So there is a basis in the space of allowed contours, which is uh, uh, which comes from the critical points. And so this is the basis of Lefschetz. Symbols, so these are uh, special contours uh, tailored to uh, so we call L sub P to the critical points. 
and the idea is the following. Uh, are you deforming the gamma within the same homology class, or it's a different? Because you're choosing different. So it's a, it's a basis of, of of gammas. So it's a basis of gammas. So any specific gamma you can expand with some coefficients. Um, so to define this uh, basis, what you do, you pick a generic, let's say, Hermitian metric on this complexified space, so x upper c. And then uh, you study the gradient flow of the real part of s over h bar. So you look for the solutions of the equation, x dot is equal to the gradient with respect to the submission metric H. Um, so the critical points are where this flow stops or starts. And then at each point, So let's let's look at, at what happens near 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 a generic critical point. So near P, you can approximate S by a quadratic function. So there is some there is a value at this point. So N. And so Z I are local coordinates. So I'm assuming that the function is uh, non-degenerate, so-called Morse function. Uh, then uh, you can actually find in the formal, you can make a formal change of variables so that this function will actually have this form in the neighborhood. And now the real part, so suppose now h is real, then the real part of s over h bar is uh, well, it's the real part of S of P over H bar plus uh, 1 over H bar and I write now X is right so so what you see you see that uh, this function has half of the positive squares and, and half negative squares in, in the expansion uh, near the critical point. And so if you look at the, uh, at the gradient flow equation, um, so let me write it like this, Z. then uh, put one half here. I'm assuming that the metric is flat. It does, you can generalize it, it doesn't really matter much. So what you see, you see that for half of the variables, this, uh, this point is uh, repulsive. So this is point P. And so for the variables x, this gradient flow repels you from, from this point. And for the variables, so this is the x variables, and the variables y are attracted. And now if you follow the, 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 the gradient flow along the x direction, then so x increases locally exponentially, but then you don't know. And you see that the real part of the function increases. And so that's the direction you want to follow in order to uh, make the integral convergent. So we take the union. 
of outgoing trajectories, so like x lines. And so this is the left shift symbol so associated with the with the contour p. So it's locally, it's it's it lo looks uh, looks like the product of a sphere. Well, it looks like a copy of of, of Euclidean space, but globally it may be very complicated. So as an exercise, um, uh, I would I propose to study the. Uh, Airy function. So it's a good good exercise is to <coughs> analyze the integral, let's say, of this form. I put some i's to make things simple. So this is the function a of x h bar. So you, you can def define it as a real integral of something which is os oscillating, but you can now use this uh, technology, discover there are two possible contours, discover there are two critical points, and it's, it's fun to play with the with left shift symbols for this. Uh, this problem. Say it again. You don't need the metric to be killer. No, I just I only require Hermitian. <laughs> so one nice feature of this flow is that, uh, in general, well, it's, you can't say much about it, but what you can say is that the imaginary part of, of S over H bar is constant along the flow. And so that you can use to prove, for example, that for generic H bar, uh, these gradient trajectories, uh, so the, the trajectories which emanate from one critical point will not enter the, the other critical point. But then you also using the same property, you can actually find when, someti when sometimes they do hit each other. And then there is an interesting story of uh, uh, transitions and kind of phase transitions. and. Complex, complex, complex. This was just for the example. So that's uh, the fun is to study for co uh, complex H bar. So, by what do you mean by generic terms of H bar? I mean, well, generic up to measure zero. <laughs> well, because this quantity is constant along the flow, if you if you map the um, so on each uh, on each left shift symbol, you have a real function, which is constant, which is the imaginary part. So, so this is constant, and the real part grows. So if you map all this into the to the S over H bar plane, then your left shift symbols they have this structure. They map to uh, half lines, right? Because the imaginary part, the imaginary part is constant, and the real part grows. So you start with the, this is the value of uh, at the critical point, and then your along the flow, the real part will only increase. So generic H bar means that these lines do not <laughs> intersect. But if so, when you start changing H bar, you're basically changing the slope of these lines, and at some point you may start hitting each, uh, different points. So that this is when things become complicated. Things are already complicated enough, so let's, let's uh, in the beginning, let's not discuss, discuss all possible complications. But, uh, I'm sorry, when you say that uh, Z is a fundamental solution to a system of yes. in which variable? So the, the parameters of S. So for example, here, the parameter of S is, is the letter X. And so this, this function solves the various uh, famous equation, so which is uh, roughly d by dx squared minus x. So that's that's the picard fuchs equation. It's a second order equation has two solutions. That's 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 because this integral has two possible contours. That's because this function has two critical points. So it's all all matches nicely. All right. So now let's go to 
the uh, infinite dimensional case, which is what we want to study. So the simplest infinite dimensional case. Path integral in quantum mechanics. So let's study the particle. Let's take non relativistic particle in the double well potential. So I'm assuming this my potential is, has a, has symmetry. Uh, that's for historical reasons. That's one. That's one of the kind of dramatic applications of these methods. But it doesn't have to. So let's take the celebrated example, the kind of real section of of the Higgs potential. So this is it's a quartic potential has two degenerate minimum and one. Uh, Local maximum. So classically, you have two uh, for low en enough energy. You have two possible uh, allowed motions: the motion around left minimum and the motion around the right minimum. <coughs> Sorry, this is going to end badly. And um, well, now we want to study the Schrödinger operator. We'll, we will. Reintroduce H bar. Well, let me put it here. Uh, and uh, well, we're interested. Let's say we're interested in the spectrum of of this uh, Hamiltonian, and we will be looking at the low lying eigenvalues of this operator. So small. Low energy states. So to, to uh, so it means that E is small. Here yeah, H bar is real, no? Well, uh, we'll start with real, and then we'll complexify. So uh, we want to we will study this by analyzing the trace. So this is uh, H, uh, curly H is the space of states, the space of uh, essentially these are L2 normalizable functions of X, so in real line. But uh, in order to, to have a better control over, the, over this uh, trace, we will be studying the Euclidean trace, so it will be not the trace of a unity operator, but the trace of the uh, contracting operator, just usual Euclidean partition function. I could put h bar down here. So t. And so what I want, I want the real part of t over h bar to be sufficiently large. So that means that in this trace, uh, only the small eigenvalues will contribute. Uh, Everything else will, will, be, will be suppressed. Now, this trace can be computed by the usual, well, can be represented by the usual path integral. Uh, and so it, in any textbook, you will you'll find the Euclidean, Euclidean path integral representation for this integral. But uh, I, today I want to, 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 to use a slightly less known, I mean, slightly less uh, used. Uh, phase space path integral representation because that's uh, that's going to teach us something. And so this partition function can be written as a formal path integral. So this is the integral over loops <coughs> S1 
into R2. So R2 is my phase space. And so they are so, so these, are, these are periodic functions of uh, one variable, call it T. Um, so they're periodic because we're computing a trace. And so what we put here, we put I over H bar integral P dx minus, uh, I will put T explicitly front. So my little T will go stupidly from 0 to 1. So it's just a parameter on the trajectory. The physical time, the physical time period will be explicitly uh, multiplying the Hamiltonian contribution to the action. So this is my minus s over h bar. So this is my, this is my definition of f s. And what you see is that this s is already explicitly not real. So it's minus i integral p dx plus t integral h of p x dt, where h is a classical Hamiltonian. So if when p, both p and x are real, my action has both imaginary and, and in real part. So this is the real part, this is the imaginary part. Uh, well, now we have this we have the integral which we analyzed in fine dimensional case. So let's try to apply this lefschetz symbol philosophy to it. So what we eventually what we will be doing we will be deforming the uh, this contour. So we view this now as a a contour inside the space of complexified, so the inside the complexified uh, space of fields, which is the space of loops into the complexified phase space, the C2. And so we will be interested in all possible contours. So, so this is the picture. So this is the, now this is an in infinite dimensional space of, so these are loops, P of T, X of T, um, so P and X are complex and they are periodic function of T. You can also, st and it's, it's inside you have the real contour, this original, original, original domain of integration, which was the space of real loops. And now what we will be looking for, we'll be looking for the critical points of the action and then some kind of left symbols which will emanate from these points and then you can try to expand this original real contour in, in this left symbols, so critical points. So these are critical points in L of C2. Uh, well, you may at first be surprised that we will look, we'll be looking at the complex values of P and X. <coughs> I, I stress that we don't change the nature of time. So time uh, here is one real dimensional. It's, it runs along, along around the circle. <coughs> the fact that it's Euclidean it, it just means that there is no I in front of this capital T. Uh, that's separate from the fact that we want to, s we, we allow the space of fields, we allow the fields to be complexified. And we do that because that's, that's what we do, we just deform the contour of integration. There's nothing deep philosophical about this. So, well, you just need to solve the, look at the variations of this uh, functional. And so what you'll get, you get minus x dot plus t p is equal to zero plus p i p dot uh, plus t u prime of x 
is equal to 0. So you need to solve these equations. And what you usually find in textbooks, you find the expression for, for the same integral where p has been already integrated out. And then uh, you somehow miss the fact that the space of fields were complexified because you can th still think that you, you are dealing with real x. And so usually uh, people say that, well, you, when you do that, you'll find an action of a particle in the inverted potential. And so there's some, some intuition behind that. But uh, the fact that even when x is real, p is already imaginary, this is usually missed. And so that's, I, would, I wanted to stress this point. So. So anyway, so what we need to find, we need to find solutions of this equation where p and x are uh, periodic. And that is not so difficult to do, actually, especially for the quartic potential. So u is dependent on p also, u prime x zero. Prime is the derivative with respect to x. So x and p are functions of t. So that's what Oh, you mean I missed the factor of t? So what, 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 what's the question? So u prime x irrelevant. So u prime of x, yes. Differentiation with respect to t or with respect to x? With respect to x. So uh, to solve these equations, you observe that these are, after all, Hamilton equations, maybe with this. And you assume that u prime x is non-zero all the way. What? U prime u dash x is non-zero always. I don't assume anything. Just so you compute u prime. So this is, this is u. You compute its zero with respect to x. It's elementary exercise. You get what you have. Sometimes it vanishes. Sometimes most of the time it doesn't vanish. Okay. So what you find is that the value of the Hamiltonian remains constant along the trajectory. So you without uh, so so you know that. This will be uh, so the whole the trajectory p of t x of t sits on a complex curve. So this is the equation of the curve for some e. So for different trajectories, the value of e might be different. But for each trajectory, there is some value of uh, curly E. And now, uh, the good thing about the quartic potential is that this equation dis defines <coughs> actually an elliptic curve. So this is an elliptic curve. You I mean, it's, this, it's actually non-compact. You can add a couple of points, and so it will be a completely elliptic curve. Uh, so you can actually visualize the trajectory <coughs> very explicitly. <coughs> Say it again. Definition of an elliptic curve. Right. So so it's a uh, uh, instead of you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So that's the elliptic curve. So it's a, it's it's actually two, it's a real torus. Uh, so it's a, it's a curve in 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 complex geometry. So p and x are both complex variables. So the uh, I mean the, the space of p and x is four real dimensional, and this is a complex equation. So it's two real equations. So it defines a surf real surface inside this four dimensional space. And uh, well, it's the surface given by this equation. And uh, well, it's uh, you can bring it to the following form up to some change of variables. Uh, let me call it so it's a different variable. And so you can, 
so from p and x you go you can go to y and x and then from y and x you can go to the so-called uniformizing coordinate z which is the integral of dx over y so you you look at the set of so g2 and g3 have some constants. They depend on, depend on the parameters and on the value of uh, the energy, <coughs> the classical energy. And then you study the integral of, of this differential. It happens to be holomorphic differential, has no singularities. Uh, the value of this integral is not unique because, well, I drew the, from the picture, you, you, you see that actually there are two non-contractible uh, cycles on, on this, uh, in this geometry. Well, you can actually see them if you look at, the, at this equation as the covering of the x-plane. There will be four branch points and uh, so this is, so there is that over each, so for each value of x away from four special points, you have two values of p possible. So this curve is a uh, two-fold cover of the x-plane without uh, four points. And so if you go around these branch cuts, uh, that represents one, one of the cycles, let's say the A cycle. And if you go in between, that's the, that's the second cycle. And so what it means is that this, this coordinate z is defined not uniquely but up to uh, two periods. So these are the periods of the of this differential around the A cycle and B cycle. And so that's the way to, to see this torus, is you take the complex plane of the variable z and, and make this identification with two primaries omega 1 and omega 2. And so that gives you this torus. But now our trajectory, our solution, it's a real one-dimensional contour. And uh, so this unif uniformizing coordinate is actually, uh, <coughs> let me call it x tilde. So it's actually, this differential is actually the differential dx over p in the, on the original curve. And that's really just the time, the dif di differential of time. So what it means is that uh, this uniformizing coordinate, which is complex, uh, flows linearly with time, which is the, the parameter on the trajectory. So the solution has this form when v0 is some constant. Which depends on, on, on the energy. And so what we want, we want the solution to be periodic. So as, as t changes by, by 1, we want to be back at the same point on the elliptic curve, which means that this v0 has to be uh, n times omega 1 plus m times omega 2, <coughs> with some integers n and m. So the, uh, geometrically, the trajectory is just a rational flow kind of windings on this elliptic curve. And so this v0 is a function of energy. And the energy should be such that it's actually quantized in, in units of, in terms of omega 1 and omega 2. Omega 1 and omega 2 are also functions of e. So it becomes a kind of non-trivial equation. Uh, so omega. These are the periods of, of, this, uh, of dif this differential over the A cycle and B cycle. These are some elliptic integrals. And so the, the, uh, the upshot is that uh, the space of, so the set of critical points is, uh, so the critical points are uh, labeled by some discrete data which is the homology cycle of the trajectory on the elliptic curve, you can locally parameterize it by two integers. I say locally because there is no a priori choice of basis. 
So you can choose uh, uh, for some. You can choose some value of energy and, and make your preferred choice of the of the A cycles and B cycles, and then transport it to the nearby points. You cannot do it globally. So this N and M will be exchanged by some kind of uh, modular group. Uh, and then you, you, so you need to fix the energy in such a way that, uh, that the, um, the trajectory closes. So this becomes uh, a condition. Uh, sorry, I forgot to say. So this, uh, so this condition eventually translates to the following condition, that the period So this is equal to t, the, the original, the original parameter t, in our problem. So this velocity, I think it's uh, actually it turns out to be just t. Uh, if you follow the, the equations, maybe i t. Yes, dx over p is t uh, of i. Okay, so this is. So this is fixed by by our. Problem. So we, we start we're studying the partition function as a function of temperature or, or Euclidean time, and then we tune E so that this equation is obeyed. It's a transcendental equation, but that's that's what it is. So this is what labels the critical points and left shot symbols. And the fact that you have this infinite number of solutions means that uh, if the partition function of the unharmonic oscillator solves some kind of word identity equation, it should be an equation of infinite order. And so the solutions will have uh, quite intricate monodromy, which is worth investigating. Uh, Bender and Wu studied the, uh, uh, in 1969, they studied the, uh, the analytic properties of the ground state energy of a different of an oscillator with different uh, lambda in which you don't see the, the so, so which has this single uh, minimum, and found that you have it becomes some kind of infinite genus human surface, and so on and so forth. But I think uh, this is more systematic. So uh, when t goes to infinity, one can safely. Expect that this classical energy, which is constant along the trajectory, actually approaches zero. And uh, what it means, it means that this elliptic curve is nearly. Degenerate, so it has a, a develops double point. In fact, it develops two double points. It has a symmetry. It's not easy to draw it. But it's so there are two places where this cycle uh, gets pinched. So you can see it's uh, it's roughly. Uh, it means that that these uh, branch points um, start all, they almost coincide. So they. The distance between these two branch points is of the order of square root of this epsilon. And uh, when the elliptic curve degenerates, it becomes a rational curve. And so the elliptic integrals become trigonometric integrals, and you can compute them. And this equation, you can actually analyze without pretty much without any calculations. And it will roughly have the form. Where uh, E naught is something of of uh, of the order of the energy uh, of the barrier height, so it's like <coughs> lambda v to the fourth over four, and T naught is the uh, frequency is the period of the classical motion around the, the minimum. So it's something like uh, one over squ square root double prime u. At v, so you can compute what it is, 
And so when uh, t goes to infinity, e goes to 0. So logarithm is large, that's which, you, which is what you need to, to get the large number t here. And so the solutions to this equation tend to indeed concentrate near 0 exponentially. But there are interesting features. There are some fa important factors of 2, which I'm <coughs> not putting here. Uh, this i t, uh, t 0 m pi. So, um, so, so what happens is now this trajectory, which used to be a rational winding, now passes between these uh, pinched points several times. And the portions of this trajectory which, which connect the pinch points, you can approximate by, by the solution of a simpler equation. And so that's where this is where we'll encounter the instantons. So for, for most of the time of the t time, the trajectory <coughs> solves, uh, so the tra well, the trajectory solves the equation p squared over 2 plus u of x is essentially 0. So this is something very small. So you can solve. So it's p is either square root of u, of 2u, or, and p, remember, is essentially x dot. So it's like x dot uh, and so this is the this is the behavior of this trajectory. Uh, When it goes between two uh, between two um, pinched cycles, and then as it cr crosses the the, the singularity, it, it uh, the plus sign gets flipped to the minus sign, and then it starts over. So you have you have m times uh, the the changes of sign occur uh, m times, where m was this the uh, number of times your cycle contains the B cycle. So the A cycle in, in this picture is the one, is the vanishing cycle, it's one which gets pinched. So this is the A cycle. It vanishes when E goes to 0. And the B cycle becomes non-compact, so to speak. So it's, uh, and so, uh, so the period of this differential dx over p over the uh, a cycle remains finite. This is a useful exercise. And the b cycle period, you can actually conclude without any calculations that it will have this logarithmic behavior as a function of the small parameter because, because of the um, uh, picard lefschetz uh, monodromy. So if, as, you, as e being small makes the full rotation goes around 0, the square root changes sign, so these two points uh, ex gets exchanged, and the B cycle, which was connecting these two points, now acquires two copies of the A cycle. So as E goes to E to the 2 pi i E, B cycle picks up uh, two, two, uh, twice A cycle. I mean, this two is not universal. It's a feature of the specific model. In, 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 in for other singularities, it could be one or, or three or something. Uh, but from this, it follows that the period of this differential should have analytic structure such that when e goes uh, around zero, uh, this period picks up a finite piece. And so that's this lo what this logarithm does. Yeah, and Nikita, is it, uh, is it, uh, did you just recover this WKB 
picture in this way. In this, uh, it's not it's not WKB here. We we don't we don't we don't talk about uh, WKB. I don't know what what why you what's your question is really about. When these large means when these degenerate pictures emerge, then. What do you kind of remind me of? What, yes, okay, might, might, might remind you, but it's not WKB. WKB is the approach of solving the differential equation directly, solving the eigenvalue equation using certain ansatz for the wave function. We're not doing that. We're not, I, I never mentioned wave function here. So. No wave function, no WKB. Okay. Uh, so we're just trying to analyze the structure of the critical points of the classical action, because that's what will determine the possible uh, uh, contours of path, integral, uh, path integration. And the main point which I wanted to make was that uh, even though these critical points have this in intricate structure, uh, for large capital T, small epsilon, small e, they can be analyzed as roughly composed out of two types of ingredients, which are the solutions of the simpler equations. And these equations, so this, this, is, this is the first example of the instanton. And this is called the anti instant one. So even though the subtle points were the solutions of the second order equation in terms of the coordinates, the uh, uh, or first order equations in phase space, these building blocks, instant ones, anti instant ones, the solutions of the algebraic equations in phase space, or the first order equations in the, in the coordinate space. Okay, good. So the rest is an exercise. Uh, let me briefly say how this picture with the elliptic curves generalizes to the uh, systems with many degrees of freedom. There's a class of quantum mechanical models where uh, this structure generalizes. Is there a question? Yes. Before going to that more complex thing, maybe I should ask you, what's, how do you understand physically this large T limit? Is it, is it because you're trying to probe the ground state? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just, so it's, 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 it's where, uh, this is where you can analyze the, uh, I mean, this is where you have better control over the, the, the subtle points. I mean, for any value of T, you can write the, this, uh, partition functions is, is a sum of the, the subtle points. It's just that the, the uh, it's kind of transcendental equation to solve. So, so, it's so was it because of more analytic control that you're going to this asymptotic regime, or did you have a physical? Well, it's historically, this was a good example because uh, this is an example where classical mechanics and quantum mechanics uh, contradict, sort of, not contradict, but it's. Uh, where quantum mechanics t t gives you something which is unexpected uh, from a classical point of view. Classically, you have two ground states, left and right, and in perturbation th theory, they remain degenerate, so you have two ground states in perturbation theory, but quantum mechanics tells us that's not the case. There is only one ground state, and this method actually allows you to, you can actually see how the classically degenerate and perturbatively degenerate uh, levels split. And the splitting is non-perturbative, and it has this uh, characteristic uh, dependence on h-bar, where s0 is the action of instanton, which is the period of this differential uh, along this trajectory. Um. So Nikita, where do you see here that it's actually the energy splitting which is determined? You have to analyze. It's, it's not, it's, it's, you, you, you don't see it immediately. You have to do the sum over all the subtle points. It's uh, it's not so easy actually. It's uh, I mean it's uh, I mean the textbooks give you a kind of a sort of simple uh, way of, of doing the sum, but the textbooks actually miss one of this one of these quantum numbers, which is important. Um, so th so in this you see in this formula, the subtle points are labeled by two integers m, which is the number of instantons and anti-instantons. And n, but there is also n, which is kind of a number of perturbative uh, fluctuations. So this is the uh, classically allowed motion, which you have to glue on top of the instanton-anti-instanton pairs. 
and um, this is usually swept under the carpet. In the and so, so uh, the summation over m actually, t well, you one shows that it has this feature that it has some m minus m minus uh, uh, s, so it's a zero over h bar uh, t to the m. And so that's uh, that gives you exponential exp exponential of the of the energy correction. Uh, you it's um, I mean I didn't I didn't spell it out. You need to actually do two computations. One computation is, is for the uh, periodic loops, and another computation for the anti-periodic loops. So, so that to actually single out the odd odd way functions. Uh, so, so there is some twist you can introduce here, but it's uh, I mean it's technically it's the same problem. And then, for out of these two computations, by you know adding and subtracting, you 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 get this uh, exponentially small uh, level splitting. And that, of course, uh, just reproduces what has been known before using a WKB method. So, so that's why. So uh, the, the summation of these instanton numbers is kind of index of some elliptic operator. It would rather later it would turn out. I don't know. No, no not not here. No, there is no. See, this is there, there is no topology. There is no topology in this problem because uh, every instanton is accompanied by anti instanton. So it's uh, so this topology is kind of emerging only when you fix the energy, the complex energy level. Then you are uh, then you have a torus which has non-contractible cycles. In the whole phase space, there is no such uh, there is no topological invariant, no, uh, and so there is no index. Index requires topology. Uh, that's because uh, you are using actually MOS function, and end of the day it will be some floor cohomology and. No, no, no. It's, these are these are Morse functions, which are real r real functions, real parts of of holomorphic functions. They all have equal Morse index, which is half the dimension of the space. It's not it's not that uh, useful for that story. Okay. Uh, maybe. maybe this side question: If you replace plane by something with positive and negative curvature, will it keep the difference? If I just replace a plane? Yeah, like by S T or by hyperbolic. So your analysis depends on the matrix. Uh, well, I mean, so here it was not not a play. There was no metric on on uh, not no a priori metric on the phase space. The metric was on the real line. W where do you want to put positive curvature on the real line? On the yeah. Right, so that I mean that's why. So you need high dimensional example. So that's why that's why that's what I'm talking about. Um. Okay. So the, the many body systems of interesting type. They're called algebraic. Integrable systems so this is where the complexification of the phase space so this is a complexified uh, complexified phase space it has this structure of the vibration of the abelian varieties And uh, so you have uh, so you have some a priori coordinates p and x. We had only one pa such pair in, in that example, and then there is a, a different set of coordinates, so-called action angle variables. So this is uh, in in the real context. That's more or less. Uh, more or less unique, but uh, in a complexified situation, there is no unique choice, not a unique choice of uh, action variables or angle variables. And so these angle variables are defined. You can normalize them that half of the periods will be uh, 2 pi integers, and another half will be, uh, my indices are all wrong, but. Will be integral multiples of some uh, 
function of the values of the angle variables, or of the action variables. Um, and now the Hamiltonians, so the integrability means that you have the number of Hamiltonians which Poisson commute is the uh, number of degrees of freedom, so half of the dimension of phase space. In, in these variables will be functions of the action variables only. And so you can repeat this analysis for the uh, saddle points of the similar uh, uh, partition function, for the path integral of the similar partition function, where now you'll have not one, but several energies, uh, several um, temperatures, if you like, uh, or chemical potentials. And so the equations, the, this uh, quantization condition for the, mm, for the values of the energy level actually have the nice uh, form of the, uh, that they correspond to the critical points of some superpotential. So it's N A A, -A plus M A A dual minus where A and A dual are the periods of the Louisville differential over the cycles on this abelian variety. So A, A. So the, the, this, is, this is complexified Louisville differential, also known as zabi differential now. And uh, so these periods we are, are familiar from the studies of BPS states and then equals to gauge theories, but this correction is not so familiar. So, and so you, so this is uh, given the integers n and m. This is some analytic function on the base of the uh, of the uh, this integral si integral system, and you look for the critical points of this function. So these critical <laughs> points will be locations where where the trajectories, which will close after finite number of revolutions, will be sitting. The correction is finite, no? This case Say it again. Finite. Yeah, it's a function on the base. No, the number of k's is k ranges from from one to n. A ranges from one to n, and n is the dimension, is half the dimension of the phase space. Yeah. This is a particular case of singularity solution. Wait, I don't, I don't think this question is relevant at this point. It's, uh, Uh, okay. Um, I mean, if time permits, we'll maybe we'll get get back to this uh, later. Maybe not. Probably, probably not today. Okay. Uh, I wanted to say a little bit about the supersymmetric quantum mechanics, because that's uh, see, see in the discussion so far. Uh, so there, there was this uh, there were these subtle points which were the solutions of the second order equations. And you can approximate them by the combinations of solutions of first order equations, instantons and anti-instantons, but uh, they all they were entering on equal footing. And uh, uh, supersymmetry is when you actually kind of can disentangle them and make uh, one type of solutions more important than the other. Um, so let's uh, so let me study again the one-dimensional supersymmetric quantum mechanical model. So this is a kind of physical way of of doing Hodge theory and uh, kind of drum cohomology for its deformation. So uh, I'll have the so the, so I'm, I'm going to describe this in terms of the first order formalism with Lagrangian. So I, again, I have my variables x and p which are bosonic, and then I'll have the fermionic variables, psi and psi bar. And this is all in one dimension, so they're all functions of time. And so we'll, we'll have some kind of uh, topological supercharge, which maps x to psi and p to psi bar, and squares to zero.
And uh, so delta square is equal to zero. It's, it's only half of the supersymmetry. There is another supercharge, which I will ignore. And uh, so now my uh, action will be, uh, I will take it to be, for most part, delta exact. And it's, it's going to be given by the integral of psi bar x dot plus i over 2 p minus v prime of x. So v is some function. So I will assume to be Morse function. So it means that the critical points are not degenerate. Uh, so, well, if you compute this, you'll get the uh, familiar, maybe I put i in front of it. So you get p x dot term from, from this term minus p squared over 2 plus i plus something plus fermionic terms. And so P enters without derivatives. If you exclude it, uh, you'll get that uh, P on shell is equal to, well, let's try to solve it. So it will be, just need to. Uh, should your variation of psi bar should be? Variation of your psi bar should be? Clear. Variation of, uh, sorry, it's, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, I it was absolutely wrong. Thank you very much. That's what it meant. So on the variable x, delta x as, a, as the RAM differential from boson to fermion. And here it acts as the Cazul um, differential from fermion to boson. Uh, and so we, when you solve, when you do the uh, variation, I think you'll get that p is i times this thing. So uh, here, the choice of the differential delta prefers instantons, which will be the locus of in the space of fields where this expression vanishes. So delta equals to zero, you get instantons. Instantons in this context means gradient trajectories, the solutions of the equation x dot equals v prime. Now, uh, one can actually do what uh, Jan was asking about, namely uh, introduce the metric. And so the metric will, well, let me do it in, in, in the case of several variables. Because so once again, dx a equals psi a d psi bar a equals p a. And now my action is i delta psi bar a x dot a. Here is the metric. Um, something which probably won't have much time to explain. Um, so one note, note of, of caution. So x is a coordinate on target space. So psi uh, is a fermion which is valued in the tangent uh, bundle, in the pullback of a tangent bundle target space. So it means that if you change coordinates, psi transforms uh, uh, homogeneously, just multiply with the uh, Jacobian of the coordinate transformation. Now, in order for this action to be invariant, You'd like psi bar to transform uh, as, the as the section of the pullback of the cotangent bundle, so also homogeneously. But then uh, this uh, supersymmetry transformation will produce some, uh, will give rise to some. Uh, so if, if I change coordinates from x to x tilde and now transform psi bar 
in a kind of naive geometric way, the result would be that P will transform inhomogeneously. Delta doesn't depend on anything. So, uh, so this is roughly like so. So, uh, so P is even though it has a lower index, it looks like it's a one form, as it is in the bosonic case. In the supersymmetric case, it's not a one form. It's it's uh, it transforms as a connection, and so in order for the action to be covariant, you need to to to, to introduce not only the metric but also uh, some connection and attention bundle. It doesn't have to be uh, the Christoffel. It doesn't have to be Levi Civita, but it could be. So that's, a, that's the origin of this term. It's to compensate for, for this inhomogeneity in the summation of P. And now, uh, if you're only interested in, the, in the correlators of delta closed observables, which, are, which correspond to essentially chromology the ramp homology of the target space, then you can play with this action so because it's uh, delta exact. And uh, so there is an interesting limit in which g goes to 0, the inverse g. So it's a large volume limit. <coughs> and v goes to infinity. So my, I make my Morse function to be very large, such that uh, the vector field, the gradient vector field, remains constant, remains finite. So in this limit, this term disappears, and you end up with a theory which, on the one hand, looks almost free, because the momenta enter the action linearly. But it's not quite free, because it actually knows about the topology of the target space. It knows that it has many critical points, and so on and so forth. And so th from this, you can recover Morse theory. Uh, I mean, in, in the way Morse conceived it. And if you don't do this, then you get kind of Witten representation, but then it's not easy to analyze. OK. Um, so 15 minutes. And uh, all right. So let's go now to infinite dimensional case. So we'll be interested in two types of uh, theories, uh, now quantum field theories, in 2D and 4D, which are kind of uh, generalizations of this model, uh, namely the Sigma models and gauge, th gauge theories. And sometimes we'll combine them. So. Uh, I mean, actually, I spent most of my career thinking about uh, th this uh, simplified approaches to to those theories with uh, you know with the instantons, which solve similar uh, simpler equations than the, f the full uh, full th full theory equations. Uh, but lately, I've been interested in the, in the trying to find the analogs of these uh, uh, smooth instanton and instanton solutions in in those theories. And so uh, I'll try to squeeze into this lecture some of the solutions, but maybe not all of them. So let's do the Sigma model. So we have a Riemann surface. Again, uh, so this is a Riemann surface, which we'll be uh, sending to, to some target space. Also Riemannian, and also we uh, so with some metric G, and with the with the B field. So the B field is locally it's a two form, more globally it's a uh, um, 
it's a connection on the on the gerb. So it's a, so you define it in patches and in such a way that uh, the the exponential of the action which I will write will is is well defined. Um, So x are some coordinates in target space, and so we describe the map by s by saying how the coordinates depend, how they become functions on the vault sheet. And then in, in Euclidean vault sheet, I will put an i in front of the b field term. So that's the typical sigma model action with the without tachyons or dilatons. And uh, you can actually map this. So this is a kind of a generalization. Uh, so this is uh, a bosonic part of the action uh, of the supersymmetric quantum mechanical action if, uh, if the B field and the metric are related in, in, in a certain way. So it's the simplest, let's say, so if x is scalar, so that the metric is scalar and, and b is the scalar form, that's the simplest, uh, simplest way of relating the metric and the, and the two form. Uh, more generally, you can introduce a almost complex structure. And require that the metric is related to uh, well, it's, well, so you, so you, it's the, so the, there is some compatibility condition between the complex structure and the and the two form. Uh, and so, in this if this is the case, then you can actually rewrite this action in the form which will look like the uh, action of supersymmetric, or as a bosonic part of the action of supersymmetric quantum mechanics. This is called the Bogomolny trick. And so it will, it's, an, it's again an exercise. So we write the action as the integral of the norm square, so it's as a norm squared of uh, the anti-holomorphic derivative projected onto the uh, holomorphic coordinates. So this is M N. So again, so J is the almost complex structure in the target space, and this operator, uh, so J, uh, since J squared is minus one, has eigenvalues on the complexification of the tangent space has eigenvalues plus i minus sign. So this operator will project you onto the uh, plus i eigenvalues, so like holomorphic components of the tangent space. And so what I want, I want the anti-holomorphic components, anti-holomorphic Walsh derivatives of the holomorphic coordinates on target space, even though the co coordinates themselves don't have to exist. It, it doesn't have to be an integral complex structure. Uh, And so there is some coefficient here. Uh, there, is, uh, there, there is some, okay, sorry. So there is a, uh, so omega is built out of B and uh, G dot J, uh, right, right, and symbolically. It's an exercise. So what, 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 what happens there? And so if this form happens to be uh, closed, then uh, this, this part of the action only knows about the topology, the, the degree of the map, and so you can you you get the, you minimize the action by setting this to zero, and so that th that way you arrive at the notion of instantons in the Sigma model, which are the pseudo holomorphic maps. Right, wrong. Uh, this is of course only when this number has certain positivity properties. So because maybe there is another way of rewriting this with the plus sign here and holomorphic derivative here. So sometimes you get anti-instantons. But uh, we, one way or another, you get the solution of the first order equation. And so the instantons 
equals pseudo holomorphic maps. So they solve this horrible equation, but it's much better than to solve the Sigma model equations, which are second order. And uh, well, we'll say something about them. Uh, now, uh, in gauge theory, in four dimensions, there is similar trick. Yes? Maybe a trivial question. Is there any condition that the sigma model becomes conformal? Yes, of course, there are, such, there are conditions, but this is classical analysis. Classically, it is always conformal. Nikita, why did you assume that J is not integrable? This may not be integrable. To assume that something is not integrable, I, I did not assume it was integrable. I didn't say I assume it is not integrable. I, I just did not assume anything about J. Just it's an almost complex structure. This is just an algebraic manipulation. That's 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 that's, that's it. If it is integrable, you get more structure. Okay, Young Mills. theory in 4D. I'm really embarrassed to, to do this, but well, I was asked, so <laughs> you suffer <laughs> and I suffer. Okay, the action uh, my tools may be wrong. So some so so here, uh, we'll be talking about the SUN gauge theories later on. And so the trace here means the trace in the n-dimensional representation. And so we now, so we work on the four-dimensional Riemannian manifold. <coughs> and so st the star here is an operator uh, which, is, which squares to plus one in two forms. So it has eigenvalues plus one and minus one. And so again, there is a way to rewrite this as the norm squared of F, F plus plus tau plus two pi i tau <coughs> I think that's what I want to write. Where tau is something like right, so and F plus is the self dual part of the curvature. So again it's the same Bogomolny type uh, manipulation and uh, well you use it so if if this quantity if this quantity is, uh, I guess, is, uh, let's see. So what do we want to say? Um, if this quantity is negative, then the minimum of the action is achieved when this is 0. Because the action, uh, the, the real part of the action, the way I defined it, uh, well, actually, it may be negative definite because uh, it, so if you represent the connection by uh, you know anti hermitian matrices, which is what uh, the Lie algebra of SUN is, then this is negative definite. So, but if in physical normalization, we usually write A is the hermitian matrix, and so this is positive definite. Anyway, so if you if you <laughs> if you trace the positivity of the action, then of course. If this is zero, then this is negative. Uh, the density of the Pentragon number, and so if this is positive, then then this is the way to to make it uh, uh, minimized. If it's positive, if it's negative, then you, you you have to do this different writing. And then you'll get tau bar here. So, um, so here these are just energy considerations that it's sort of favorable to look at instantons or anti instantons depending on, on the topological charge. But once you uh, embed this into a supersymmetric theory, then again the supercharge which you single out 
will tell you that uh, the, uh, the uh, correlation functions of operators which are annihilated by the supercharge will be saturated by instantons or by, or by, by anti-instantons. And so that's what we will be uh, analyzing, I guess, tomorrow. Uh, I have four minutes. So, so there's a one more thing which I wanted to mention, just kind of educational thing, that you can combine single model and gauge theory. Uh, if there is a, let's say, H, it acts on X, preserves G plus IB. So it's both, it's a both isometry and uh, uh, let's say X by Hamiltonian trans transformations on B. Then you can couple the Sigma model to, to uh, <coughs> the gauge theory, with gauge fields in H. So write this in this way, uh, coupled to the young new section with some coupling constant and couple it to the, there is a potential uh, trace mu squared, where mu, okay, so the, the, um, the vector fields which generate the, uh, the action of H, so the, since they preserve B, means that the linear derivative of B is zero, and uh, the action is Hamiltonian when this when the contraction of the vector field with B is actually exact. It's D of, of some function. So this is the, the moment map function. And so we'll put it here. Um, and the covariant derivative of X is simply the ordinary derivative plus, uh, plus the uh, gauge field. So A is the H gauge field. And um, so that's the way to uh, describe roughly the single model on the quotient with the target space, the quotient x over h. But it's not exactly the quotient because we, uh, unless we force, uh, well, we either, uh, there are two interesting limits when e goes to zero, e goes to infinity. Unfortunately, e is the massive, it's the dimensional parameter. So uh, having, uh, uh, well, anyway, so, so when, uh, E goes to infinity, sorry, um, the Bogomolian trick which I just raised, what works again in this case, uh, and you end up now with equations which, are, which say that, first of all, the map is covariantly holomorphic. And then um, there is something like stability condition that the curvature of the connection A plus E squared times mu times the volume form on, on sigma is equal to zero. So, you, so you, you, when you can must rewrite the section, re rearrange the section to, 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 look, to make it look like a sum of the squares, of norm squares of these two equations. And when E goes to infinity, uh, this equation tells you that mu should be zero almost everywhere. So it means that and so uh, so these equations will actually define for you a map from sigma to the symplectic quotient of, of x. But it's not, unfortunately, it's not always the case. So, so you, cannot all, you cannot achieve this map to pass through the uh, locus. Uh, so sometimes, so there are some points, uh, there are solutions where, where uh, uh, the image does not pass through the locus mu equals to zero. And so then, so these are some kind of uh, degenerate instanton solutions uh, or freckled instantons. And uh, so that's the important difference between the instantons engaged linear sigma model, well, could be linear if x was, was vector spaced. So this is uh, versus 
nonlinear sigma model. So the, the moduli spaces of solutions of the of so pseudo holomorphic holomorphic maps or pseudo holomorphic maps into this space is not the same as the moduli space of, of solutions to these equations, but the I mean the, the difference between them is kind of local. So some in some calculations you can actually model this difference by a certain change of uh, couplings by some kind of contact term redefinition, and that's known as a mirror map in in uh, in the context of uh, uh, a models in two dimensions. So how this H acts on mu inverse zero? Is it GIT portion or this by isotopy? What do you mean? H preserves mu? Mu equals to zero? What? How? It's a Hamiltonian action. You're assuming that. From this equation, it follows that uh, uh, the locus mu equals to zero is H invariant. So you can, so you can uh, quotient uh, by H. Mu transforms in the joint representation, in the quad joint representation of H in general. All right, so I think that's enough for today. We'll continue tomorrow. <laughs>